Today's episode is presented by Public. Public Public.com has just launched its new high-yield cash account, offering an industry-leading 5.1% APY. No fees, no subscription, and no minimums or maximums. That means you can grow your cash with 5.1% interest with no strings attached. It's as simple as that. Again, that is 5.1% interest with no fees. 5.1% interest with no subscription, 5.1% interest with no minimums or maximums, and 5.1% interest with up to $5 million of FDIC insurance. Just 5.1% interest straight up, no strings attached. Sign up today at public.com backslash chit chat money. This is a paid endorsement for public.com, 5.1% APY as of December 20th, 2023, and is subject to change. Full disclosures and terms and conditions can be found in the podcast description. High yield cash accounts are available for U.S. members only. Welcome to Chit Chat Stocks. On this show, hosts Ryan Henderson and Brett Schaefer analyze businesses and riff on the world of investing. As a quick reminder, Chit Chat Stocks is a CCM Media Group podcast. Anything discussed on Chit Chat Stocks by Ryan, Brett, or any other podcast guest is not formal advice or recommendation. Now, please enjoy this episode. All right. Welcome in, everyone. Today on Chit Chat Stocks, we have I think either second or third time guest, it's the Motley Fool's Lou Whiteman, someone who's been covering the aerospace market for a long time. We're talking Boeing today, and we're also going to talk the broader aerospace market, but I want to lead in Lou with one question that I think some analysts could go on for a full hour on. What went wrong at Boeing? Oh, this is, I mean, I'll go real short on this. What didn't go wrong on Boeing is the answer, right? Um, If you want more, so I think it's been said before, but I think GE is a helpful comparison here. And the the great irony, the Shakespearean nature of it here is that it's a company that got so focused on earnings and near-term profits and the shareholder over everything else. And of course, what it has done is it has cost shareholders dearly. Um, a lot of people like to go back to the 1997 McDonnell Douglas merger, which is kind of the argument there is the St. Louis bean counters overran the Seattle engineers. I think there's some truth to that, but I, I think I'd argue the rot was forming at Boeing even before then, uh, which is partially why McDonnell Douglas was so necessary and so appealing. They needed the engineering talent there. Um, where would Boeing be in the last 15 years without the F-18? For example, you know, they bought a lot into there. Um, It all, of course, just exploded with the 737 MAX. uh, And but, you know, look, there's been issues all over the company. Boeing hasn't won a fighter competition basically in my lifetime, definitely in you guys' lifetime. Uh, That's an embarrassment for Boeing. And it also builds upon itself because there's billions in R&D that the companies get from each of these programs. Every time a Lockheed Martin won a a contract, there's years of development, years of government-funded R&D, years of this intellectual advantage built into that. So when you keep losing, it does compound. Uh, Boeing's marquee military platform right now is the KC-46, which is a fuel tanker. It's not glamorous. It is important. But note, the competition resulted in Boeing execs going to jail. And by the way, the plane came in and billions over budget. And when they finally was delivered, the Air Force had to take them out of service almost immediately because debris was left inside from the construction process. Uh, this is a company that just hasn't done things well in a long time. You know, uh, Even on commercials, some 87 Dreamliner has had quality issues. The triple seven X, the new version of the seven seven seven, is years behind schedule. Uh, Boeing has been distracted, unfocused, and has become less good at its core reason to exist over a multi-decade period. And that's just kind of just, it, that's hard. That's to use an airline phrase. That's a hard tailspin to pull out of. Right, and that, that, I guess that's good context for someone who hasn't been following the story, which. It became a national news story, you know, with the two tragic crashes. I think it's five years ago now. But yeah. and people might say, "Hey, you know, this is one issue. Why can't you guys get your act together?" But you're saying it's been similar to GE, a multi-decade period. 
And I think maybe before we get into the specific, what the company is dealing with right now and how they're trying to deal with it, why, why would you, what makes Lockheed and Boeing different? Like what, why is Lockheed more successful in certain aspects or in maybe a lot of aspects in winning these projects versus someone like Boeing? Well, I mean, there's an argument that Boeing has always spread itself too thin. I mean, it's a massive organization, but it is a commercial and defense company. Lockheed is the largest pure play defense contractor, but they're a smaller company than Boeing, you know, so they are more focused. As I said, I think these things, I mean, the original contest they won, if you go back to like the F-22 Raptor, that was a, a, a close contest. So it wasn't like Boeing didn't have a chance. I do think these things build on each other. Uh, I do think that, you know, the 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 top secret organization, the 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 the, the skunk work, skunk works that uh, Lockheed has. It's a very very good research shop, which that helps. But um, you know, it's to some extent it makes you wonder if you know you try and be a master of all, and you end up not an expert on anything. That sort of has been the Boeing story for for last couple of decades here, unfortunately. Makes sense. Okay, I'm going to let Ryan jump in with another qu question after this one, but let's hit their Q4 earnings. We don't need to specifically talk the numbers. They had a decent report, and that's because it was before these issues popped up again. But what, I guess for anyone that doesn't follow the company closely, what is their plan for addressing these issues? I know I read a few headlines, and it seemed that to say we're going to get our act together. And that's all they said. So I, I, I wonder if they're like what their plan is to fix the 737 max and all the manufacturing stuff they've had problems with across the country. Yeah. If there's ever an argument for the value of long-term investing, if you just traded off the headlines that generated out of this earnings, you would think this was the best company in the world. It was a great earnings report in a vacuum. Cheers, guys. You're doing great. Keep going. We'll talk to you in three months. But um, as you say, there's a lot more going on there. The plan to address it is pretty simple. It is. We need to get our act together. It's a little more nuanced. They need to do so in coordination with regulators instead of almost, um, I don't want to say in spite of them, but there's been sort of a, a adversarial relationship where the FAA is just keeping innovation back. Those days are over. Their credibility is gone. They also talk a lot about being transparent, which is somewhat related to regulators. It's somewhat related to their airline customers who, I mean, you look, Boeing and United were part of the same company way back, if you go back all the way out in history. The, the United Airline Group was formed by William Boeing. Um, that's how close their relationship has been. And so when the CEO of United is saying, I don't know if we can buy Boeing planes anymore, it is time to be more transparent. Um, the good news is, you know, this, the original 737 MAX problem was an engineering issue. That's why it took so long. Everything that's happened since, these are mostly workmanship issues. These are shop issues. I don't think there needs to be a big paradigm shift or a new, you know, McKenzie plan to come in. They just need to do as they say. They just need to do their jobs better, which in theory is easy, right? <laughs> the uh, a couple of things. So first off, you mentioned the GE comparison. If I'm not mistaken, the current CEO was a GE guy, right? That's where his so. background was. So. Yeah, um, that sounds right. Okay, so I guess there's so many ways to go about this conversation. So for starters, how much people have talked about the FAA or uh, Federal Aviation Authority, I believe is what the acronym stands for, slowing things down. Administration, at Boeing. yeah. Yeah. Administration. Yeah. Do you think that's true? I No. I mean, they, you know, this is so hard to say because you can always point to instance. So it's, you know, you have to take the, the bigger picture. I would argue that they had basically the FAA inspectors as a captive in-house unit leading up to the max, where, I mean, it was literally, they were doing some of the work and just turning in their homework to the FAA. And I believe hindsight has shown us that that was not a great way to go. Um, you know, you mentioned the CEO, Dave Calhoun, and, you know, it's, it's worth mentioning that he was brought in as the fixer when the 737 max happened. Uh, he was also the chairman of the board for the 10 years prior to that, who officially, if you're old fashioned like me and you think the board is supposed to have oversight, it wasn't exactly cleaning house to bring in the person who was the head of the oversight of all of this disaster as the fixer. Um, but yeah, no, there's, it's always been a weird 
Boeing is America's champion. And in a world where the U.S. doesn't export as much as we used to, especially on the industrial side, Boeing has always been a shining star and a source of you know U.S. pride. I do think that that led to what they call regulatory capture, where you know, and um, no, I don't, I don't think I'd, I'd be hard pressed to blame what has happened to this company on the FAA. You mentioned the quote from the United CEO. How much do you think that is maybe like a negotiating tactic for new orders from the airlines, where it's like, ah, I don't know if we can. And it's like, well, if the price comes down a bit, I guess we could. Probably seventy percent. I think I, I think your instinct is right then, but I do think it's still telling how public it has become. Not just with them. Uh, Emirates is the big one. Emirates is basically half of the seven triple seven X order book. They can single handedly make or break that plane, and they have shifted orders and are really considering it. Um, Look, I don't know how much they have to negotiate in public right now. Boeing has been so desperate to move metal. Some of these massive deals, like the one they signed with United since the Max incident, I would love – they weren't playing, paying list price on that. I don't necessarily think I, – I mean, I think reality puts them in a good bargaining position. I think that, yes, Scott Kirby is willing to do business with them, the, the United CEO, but I also think there was genuine frustration of, you know, oh, you know, like with GE, every time you stomp out a cockroach, another one is running on three months later, you know? Yeah. And I think there's a couple variables at play where you get the giant backlog. Yeah. On one hand, I think it's 10 years, say roughly 10 years, could be even 12 at this point. They have such a large fixed cost base and they need to get to that. I don't have the exact number in front of me. It's, I think, maybe 50, 737s a month or maybe even higher to kind of get to positive profitability. But the issue is, and what has been in the news, you know, I think the Wall Street Journal has been reporting on this a lot, is that the FAA is purposefully slowing them down because of the quality issues. So how do you see this playing out? I know it's really hard to predict. And if we could all predict it with 100% certainty, we can make a lot of money owning it. Hey, what are these stocks or shorting them? But with, you know, can they make progress on this over the next few years? Or given the quality issues, is it just going to be a slower pace? The airlines are going to get fewer planes. More and more planes might go to Airbus. How do you see it, you know, maybe over the next three to five years? So, so quick context here to kind of back up what you're saying. Uh, d- deliveries were down 30% year over year in January. And this was heading into the year going to be the year of recovery. We're not, we don't want to see deliveries down. We're supposed to see them ramp. Um, they can deliver. Most of the current problems are short term. We've already seen things slowly start. But to, to your point, um, the rate of growth is going to be questioned and how many planes they end up delivering and how much cash that generates. Uh, Prior to the uh, 2018 original MAX incident, this was going to be the best-selling plane of all time. It was going to be running at 60 to 70 frames per month. Uh, They are hoping to get to the high 30s this year. Uh, Why does this matter? This is kind of the crux of kind of what you look at in earnings right now. Don't really look at earnings, but um, just uh, let's look at the balance sheet. Because that's where this company has made or break, make or break itself as far as an investment. Uh, for context, go back to 2017, before the original Max issues, Boeing had $8 billion in debt. Today, it's $46.9 billion. That's down from, I think, $60 billion or so in 2020. They rightly, between the pandemic and what was going on with the lack of cash coming in with the max, they mortgaged every stapler in the the building, basically. They took on all of the debt they could to make sure they lived to see another day. The cost of that is, is that now you have to pay down that debt. Uh, They generated $6 billion in operating cash flow in 2023. That's probably the highlight of the earning. Um, They still expect to generate cash this year, but they did. They suspended 2024 guidance because of all this. Um, I note they said that our plan to bring down debt by 2026 is still on track. Given their history, the fact that they can't see 2024 but still see 2026, I'm a little skeptical. It's, if you don't know what you're eating for lunch tomorrow, it's really hard to say what you're going to eat for lunch in a month, right? Um, but the idea of it is, is that these are speed bumps and not blockades. 
and that they should, in theory, that ramp that they were talking about going into this year, it should eventually happen. And over time, it will be that those deliveries, the cash from actually getting airplanes to customers, that they will use to bring down that debt back to a range where it was prior to the um, prior to all the issues. And that's when this can become a profitable, functioning, healthy business again. So that that's kind of the bogey when you see a quarterly earnings report. Look at where the debt is. Look at what they're saying about their plans to pay down the debt based on what they're saying about the cash flow they think see coming in. Those are the numbers to watch as an investor. All right. This might be skipping ahead, but let's say when I hear the bull case for Boeing and I hear ramping up production, my gut reaction is that there could be some quality lapses that you are potentially compromising safety for production targets and it, it gets me worried maybe as a civilian. Is there any world in which the debt is so insurmountable that this is a nationalized business? Because it seems like it's a critical need for America and it's really hard to start a competitor just given the capital intensity. Is there, could you see any world where this is just owned by the government? Yes, but we're nowhere near there. I mean, you know, it, it, it's a very dangerous, I feel like uh, Charlie Brown with the football, you know, saying, uh, uh, but, you know, assuming this is it, we're fine. And I don't want to say that with them. And that's probably why I don't own the stock. But um, I think, I mean, they are still going to deliver a lot of airplanes. They are still going to generate cash. They are still going to be able to manage the debt. Things we would need to see a repeat of one of the real massive shocks to the system, and maybe you know to exit uh, either what happened with the pandemic or with an eighteen month grounding of something as important as the max. It would take that sort of an event or more, to, I think, to get there. But there's a huge vast in between there between everything's fine and nationalization, which is kind of that muddy, murky middle. As an investor, that's not really that exciting. And I think somewhere in there is probably probably the most accurate until we see proof that they can do better. Yeah. I was going to ask about, you know, we don't maybe get to the nationalization part, but given your concerns about the balance sheet and the lack of cash flow and the lack of predictability on the cash flow if they can't get the manufacturing up, what's the timeline on when things could get hairier for this stock? Is it... One year, three years, five years? What do you see as someone who's followed this for, for a while? You know, I it's funny because the latest incident uh, moved the stock a little, but it didn't. And I think this is a shareholder base that is so beaten down. Uh, I, I, I think that works against you on a recovery. I think very, very justifiably, if, if, if the three of us are sitting on the sideline looking at Boeing, we probably need a little more time than we would for another company to build credibility. So I don't think you're going to see a rush in. But at the same time, I feel like all of these death by little cuts, that is priced in. I think, again, to kind of answer similar to what I just said to Ryan, I, I think it would take some sort of a catastrophic thing to really, really fall. I mean, Boeing shares at the heart of the pandemic, that crazy, was it late March or so? I believe they were down 70% from where they had been pre-max. They've recovered some of that. I mean, that looks like a bottom. I mean, I think they were down below $100, $100 at, at the heart of it. Um, so we could get there again. But I think it would take that sort of event, not just two or three more oopsies even, because we're kind of, I hate to say it, numb to the oopsies. Right. Okay, this Are is you a fun one. Oh, all okay. right. You got it, Ryan. Do you want me to ask the, right. the CEO one or no? No, but well, I do want you to ask that, but let me just intervene. The are you at all surprised that the stock has? I don't want to say held up because it's gotten crushed, but are you surprised by its multiple today? Yeah, but I think again, it kind of talks to the natural advantages it has. I mean, Brett mentioned the ten-year backlog. The and I mean, we can talk about the relationship with the Airbus in a minute, but just the fact that. You know, it's it's almost a utility like business. You have no choice. 
And in theory, again, these are not major engineering problems. These are just do your job problems. So it's, I think, enticing. But I mean, if you would look, I, I mean, if you factor in the debt, the stock's down, I think it's basically cut in half from where it was before the first max crash. On an enterprise value basis, it's only down 30% or so from there. So, you know, I mean, it, it really is. I mean, I think it speaks to the potential of this business and the inherent advantages they have and the so-called moats they should have. But, you know, again, I, I, I think we're kind of stuck in the mud in a way, because at the same time, are you going to believe it the first month that they, I mean, like, it's going to take a lot more than one or two months of, hey, guys, nothing fell off a plane this month, right? I mean, I, I, I don't think that's the burden of proof here. So we're kind of stuck in this weird middle where it should work, but it doesn't. Yeah, I totally get that. I think it would take, as a civilian, I mean, people are probably going to be talking about the 737 MAX. I wouldn't be surprised if some people were making jokes about it 15, 20 years from now. The reputational yeah. damage just seems strong. Before we move on, we want to talk about our friends at FinChat.io. FinChat.io is the complete stock research platform for fundamental investors. Beyond having all the standard financial data for companies around the globe, they also have company-specific segments and KPIs on over 1,500 stocks. So if you want to see Amazon's AWS revenue over the last 10 years, or you want to track Match Group's paying users, maybe you're curious how many stores Sprouts Farmers Market added last quarter, FinChat tracks all those KPIs and literally half a million more. We know that if you're a fundamental investor, you probably track this stuff yourself, but this saves so much time and it has all the data you already need. If you aren't sure where to go, you can also simply ask FinChat. That is their conversational AI powered by FinChat's proprietary data. So that'll save you tons and tons of time researching. They've got stock screening tool. They've got fundamental charting that is best in class in terms of design. I use FinChat every day. I absolutely love the platform. Brett does as well. We both use it as our primary dashboard and the place where we do all our research. So if you want to get 25% off any paid plan, use our link finchat.io slash chitchat. That is finchat.io slash chitchat. The link will also be in our show notes. Okay, next question. And this one's going to be a fun one, but I want to make it a two-parter because I think Boeing maybe is less interesting as a potential investment right now, but more important or more fascinating as a case study for how to avoid creeping companies that could you know lose their touch and stuff like that. So first one, Lou, if you were CEO, what is the first thing you would do to help fix Boeing's issues? I know that's a very hard one. And second, what signs did investors miss in the 2000s and early 2010s that they could have seen if they looked at Boeing, you know, with a fresher pair of eyes? So, I mean, I've already sort of given my thoughts on the current CEO. So if I was him, I think the first thing I'd do is I'd fire myself and beg Alan Mulally to take over. Uh, you might remember Alan from Ford. Ford stole him from Boeing. Uh, and there was rumors that at the time Dave Calhoun, the current CEO, came in that Mulally, was, if, if called, would have answered. But, um, you know, we've already said this isn't like it doesn't need a great big think. It just need there isn't a secret sauce here. There's no like, you know, business school cheat code. They just have to execute. And Mulally well-deserved reputation for what he did at Ford and what he did with Boeing of actually just executing, getting the house in order, cleaning up the terrible self-inflicted mistakes. I don't think if I'm the current CEO, I've done a very good job of that. I, I don't know if Mulally would come back, but someone in that ilk, that's who I, the, the, you know, I, I think that's what they need. They just need someone who will roll up their sleeves and be the adult in the house and get it done. Um, as for signs, that's a great question because it did play out over generations. I do think, though, I mean, I gave you kind of just a quick rattled off some of the failures over time. I do think it was staring at us in plain sight that maybe quality was not job one there to borrow. I, I think that's Ford, so I think I'm really being cute now. But um, but that I, I do think, you know, this is a story of death by a thousand cuts until all of a sudden the big one happened with the Max and everyone was looking at it. 
I do think that maybe we were lulled into it's Boeing. They have all these competitive advantages. It'll all work out, you know, but I, I, I do think that if there's a lesson here, it's, 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 and this might be very obvious or very silly, but look at the reality and not just the perception of what you think it should be. Uh, Cause the reality at Boeing, it, it's been a weird story for a long time. A lot of pressure from customers, a lot of maybe short-sighted decision because of that pressure, a lot of just sort of uh, running to stand still, even at their best. And then with all of these little problems that indicated maybe a deeper culture. Rock. I want to uh, highlight some notes that Brett had on, I'm not trying to pour gas in on the fire here when it comes to knocking Dave Calhoun, but the, in 2022, uh, it says, I'm going to read this note from Brett. It says, the annual bonuses are a bit complicated, but generally go down to each of its segments and are based on earnings power and free cash flow. Combined, the company hit its free cash flow targets. Keep in mind, they had a bunch of planes sitting on the side and uh, were just waiting to deliver them So and waiting to receive the payment for those. So cash flow is going to be elevated because of the inventory. But they missed their earnings target and still got paid 100% of their annual payouts. What do you think the odds are, Lou, that uh, Boeing hits 100% of their annual targets for 2023 for executive compensation? I'm guessing they feel pretty good about it. <laughs> yeah. It's... Well, here's that leads to this the cult, you know, the people talk about the executive team culture. And you mentioned that the current CEO was the chairman of the board during the deadly crashes that were much worse than these current ones. Can an activist step in here? Could that, it seems like maybe too big of a company, but. Bezos. Uh, yeah, I was yeah. saying Bezos should do it, but. Uh, Is that why he's selling the Amazon shares? That's, that's, we have a scoop here, folks. Uh, yeah, that's my, that's my conspiracy theory. Yeah, I'm connecting all the dots here. <laughs> I, I, I mean, so I, I do think that given what I said, that all it really needs is a good execution guy that may, or, you know, or person that maybe that it's ripe for just a, an activist to put in, you know, to kind of get involved. The problem is, as you say, it's still a massive company, even with the haircut. So I don't know. And, and it's not really, I mean, look again, it is, even if all goes well, it takes time to pay down billions and billions of debt. So it's not going to be, this isn't a stock, you know, you're not going to be in today out by year's end if you're an activist and i mean not all of them are focused on that but they it does feel like there's probably easier targets to go after right yeah that that is for sure all right we're gonna focus on the broader aerospace market and how boeing and all its troubles can affect them but the first one that they can affect is the second competitor it's called the duopoly although we'll talk about how china is growing their influence here very slowly, but growing it, you know, with their, their national backing. Airbus, I think the stat is, and correct me if I'm wrong, is two thirds of new single body jets and Boeing is one third. And that market share was actually flipped around 10 years ago. <laughs> so could Airbus pull farther and farther ahead here? Could they take even more market share over the next decade? And what could be the implications of that? So, I mean, the bulls would tell you that a lot of that is current events, and if anything, it's more likely to be some sort of a bounce back towards even, maybe maybe not back to the crown. Um, but, you know, the, the answer is kind of. Uh, you know, it's important to remember that cultures are always evolving, and it's fun to kind of look at Airbus kind of, you know, it, this is a period. One of the weird things about this is Airbus has almost had a positive cultural overhaul at the same time Boeing has struggled, which has kind of exasperated the the, the troubles or, or kind of highlighted the difference. Um, Airbus's origin story, as you guys probably know this, it's a collection of government efforts to counter Boeing. It was led by the British, French, and German governments, and they, they made a decent plane, but they got a lot of state support, very much hampered by political demands. This was a company that couldn't close a factory in Britain unless they closed one in France and Germany at the same time. You know, a lot of non-economic decisions were being made. Over time, Airbus is become a lot more nimble than it used to be. It is still kind of tied to its sponsor governments, but the government sort of got religion on why that didn't work. 
Airbus has over time evolved into a more rational market participant to their benefit. Uh, there's some luck involved here, too. Airbus bought the A200 from Bombardier, uh, gave them a great fuel-efficient small jet option. Boeing tried to counter that by buying the uh, commercial business of Embraer out of Brazil. Uh, that fell through during the pandemic. That's probably good in terms of retaining the cash, and Boeing certainly doesn't need another distraction. But there's a huge hole in Boeing's product portfolio at a time when airlines are looking for total solutions or looking to buy in packages. So there's a lot of, like, little things compounding here. Airbus has turned itself into a really, really good company. And we can kind of talk later, but they, I mean, they have other advantages going from here. I don't think, I think there's limits to their domination and that's just capacity is the big thing and a demand outstripping capacity. And if Boeing can get back to just making a good product, they are going to do just fine. But the world where it's everybody chasing Boeing, that's over. Yeah, that is certainly the case. Now, you're someone that covers a lot of different aerospace companies. We've talked Transdime. We've talked Heiko. You covered a lot of the defense-focused companies. I want to imagine a scenario where Boeing is still, say, 2028, 2030. They may not you know, regardless of how much cash they're generating, that's fine. But they're still bragging about a 15-year backlog, but they can't really seem to get it fulfilled. You know, they keep struggling to get planes out the door. Who benefits from this and who struggles from that going forward? Do the trans dimes of the world benefit? Do, you know, the airlines benefit from reduced capacity? What, what are your thoughts there? Any, any direction you want to go? Private hangar companies, maybe, <laughs> that are like storing these. Maybe they're going to be storing it on a, yeah, I 5 by then, right? They can just like, yeah, exactly, stack them exactly. out there. Um, yeah, this is an interesting question because it, the obvious, there are obvious answers, but I, I, I kind of have questions about all of them. I mean, the easy answer is Airbus, right? We just talked about it. Airbus is the primary beneficiary as the other half of the A and B duopoly. But, you know, I'm not sure how much they benefit given there are no holes in their order books for years. I mean, again, they are not going to build another factory because Boeing can't get their lug nuts on tight, okay? Um, if anything, what we're seeing right now is Airbus is scrambling to create opportunities. Airbus sees this as maybe, oh, we have a once-in-a-generation opportunity to steal United. But we need to get to planes sooner than we have spaces. We are going to buy off places on our delivery list. So if anything, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm not arguing it. I mean, I, I, I think it might be a great move for them. But if anything, their margins may decline in the near term if this is successful, because they are literally, you know, in, both enticing United and buying off existing customers to just defer to later. So, you know, absent Airbus saying we need to build three more factories, which I don't see happening, how do they take share in that environment? Um, I do think you mentioned Transdime and Heiko. I mean, they, we, we call it the aftermarket, the spare parts business. And yes, if the supply of new planes onto the market doesn't increase as fast as we thought, it should mean that older planes remain in service, correct? Which should be good for spare parts salesmen. But honestly, if you look at what's going on in the global market, you know, we are, it is a glowing global aviation market. A lot of the story here is not fleet replacement. Some of it is, especially on the less fuel, you know, the older ones, you know, trying to get fuel economy. But, you know, a lot of this is about growth and not fleet replacement. A lot of those planes aren't going to be taken out of service right now anyway, especially when we called our fleets with the um, pandemic. So does it really move the needle for spare parts? Maybe a little, but I don't. You know, not to the extent, um, not not the extent that you know maybe it, it should. Uh, what companies struggle? The obvious one is uh, Boeing's little cousin, Spirit Aerosystems, uh, based out of the Midwest, which um, used to be part of Boeing. This was part of the economic engineering that they kind of basically decided to outsource their manufacturing. So they took all of these huge factories in the Midwest and Wichita mostly that were actually building the fuselages that were building a lot of the big parts of the airplanes, sold it off to private equity. It became a public company. Spirit has been a really lousy public company over the years. You know, when 70% of your sales come from 
your former parent. You're very reliant on that. It's it's a terrible relationship for both sides because Boeing can't make planes without Spirit. Spirit can't exist without Boeing. Um, there's probably an argument to be made to buy them back in house, but I don't think Boeing really wants to do that. Um, they will continue to struggle as long as Boeing does, and they're not much of an investment, even if even if um even if Boeing goes well. Another one to look at, and kind of similar vein, Triumph Group, which is a supplier that has had a lot of trouble over the years. This isn't making their life industry easier, and again. Excuse me. These companies will continue and make it because they are the only ones making these key parts, but it involves a lot of Boeing forward payments to keep them afloat at times and limited profitability everywhere. Uh, this was Boeing trying to squeeze whatever they could out of their supply chain when times were good, and it's sort of biting everyone now. Do the flyers, like the end customers, ultimately lose here? Does this culminate in higher airplane ticket prices i i think we have permanently moved beyond irrational pricing in the industry i know that's uh, that's scary to say I mean, it's probably stupid to say anything's permanent but um again on the margins perhaps but i don't we already had a problem the whole reason JetBlue was trying to build, buy spirit or part of the reason was to just get their hands on the spirit order book we already have a problem where airlines feel constrained with with growth because of the number of airplanes uh again if boeing is making 28 planes instead of 35 in a given month that is going to have some knock-on effect uh, i do think as far as beneficiary the airlines themselves we, we talked about it before just even after the max came back it was a great time to buy airplanes and you saw a lot of deals where a commitment to buy 300 planes starting in 2024 uh, or 2026 and they are basically buying in future future deliveries at at rock bottom prices coming right off the max crisis um to the extent that boeing is still having trouble down the line like brett in your scenario where they are just they still have this order book but they aren't fulfilling them the way they hoped you are going to see a lot of reworking and a probably a very very good deals for the airlines which will just again com further compound or further delay recovery for boeing that's yeah, Ryan. Michael O'Leary said, I want to pull up the quote here. If the, he was referring to the other airlines, he said, if they don't want their max tents or otherwise, we'll take them. And it yeah. seems like every every crisis in the aerospace industry somehow leads to Ryanair gaining market share, I guess. Right. <laughs> Michael O'Leary is very good at that. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now, I think that brings up an interesting point. This is not something I necessarily believe in, but I believe I talked about it on one of our, me and Ryan's uh, shows that we do together one time. And it's the thesis that I think Buffett may have had, and then now he disagrees with that he sold all his airline stocks, is the fact that the airlines were terrible businesses for a long, long time, similar to the railroads. But then the railroads 30 years ago ended up becoming great businesses because there was a change in the entire sector. Do you see that at all happening here? Are there similarities or, or is that, or would you be bearish on that take? But, well, Buffett's been all over the place. You know, his greatest quote was, it was one of his annual meetings that if a capitalist was a kitty hawk, they would have shot the damn thing down, which is you know, one of my favorite uh, quotes of his. But uh, look, I do believe, I, I'm, I'm going to say yes and no here. I do believe that the industry from the, the go-go days from when I was first coming up when, you know, gosh, TWA, Eastern, Braniff, all these, you know, every time you had an economic downturn, you had bankruptcies. Those days are over. Part of that is, is just cutthroat consolidation. You know, we went from six majors to three and Southwest bought AirTran. Southwest is now the biggest U.S. carrier, but those four the companies, it's like 80 something percent of the market share. They are rational pricing, kind of the days of ego building and just pricing the fill planes are done. Delta has been a great leader on this. We would rather just not have your business than to fly an extra plane to get you there. And that is a pretty good business. That said, it is still a high fixed cost cyclical business. Um, I, I don't personally own any airlines anymore. I, I, I bought some during COVID and sold at the highs, but uh, it, I, I 
am both bullish on long-term growth in aviation and also not a holder of airline stocks, just the nature of business. I'd point you to a company like Aircap, AER, if you want to play the just a long-term investment where if you want to invest in the growth and importance of, of airplanes without having to tie your fortune to an individual airplane, airline stock. Okay, and maybe a quick follow-up. What are the airlines that are most exposed to Boeing? I think you mentioned United. And then what are the ones that are most exposed to Airbus, which I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, is Delta? Delta is very exposed. But, you know, they all have, all the big ones have some sort of a blend. It's just where the blend is. Uh, yeah, United is specifically exposed to the, some of the 737 Maxes that have gotten in trouble. Uh, the biggest airlines exposed to, to Boeing uh, you'd have to go down a layer to Southwest would be the obvious one. I mean, Southwest is kind of like what we said about Boeing and Spirit, Aero Systems, not the airline. But it's sort of Southwest and Boeing have this odd relationship. All Southwest flies famously are variations on the 737. However, they are so important of a customer to Boeing, they are the ones that demanded all of those shortcuts be taken on the MAX, then ended up really with the max problem. So there, there's kind of a weird relationship there. They, Ryanair, some of these big discounters all over the world that use them are the most reliant. Uh, kind of on the other side, a lot of, you know, the, the pure Airbus fleets are mostly in the U.S., the smaller companies, the Frontiers, the JetBlues, the Spirit. Um, the big diversified airlines have a lot of planes from a lot of different companies they the the shift varies and yeah delta has been a big airbus buyer in recent years but none of the big airlines are going to survive one of the companies falling off a cliff well but it's also not going to put them out of business all right. What are your thoughts on the new competitors hitting the market? Now, I think there's two classes here. One, there's China with their national champion. I forget its name, but they just had their first maiden flight. And second are a lot of startups such as Boom and others who may be years and years away, but it seems to me there's been a resurgence in VC investment in the defense industry and aerospace industry and in that seeing Boeing's failures may be opening up a lot of people to saying, hey, there could be an opportunity in this industry that previously people thought, you know, why would we ever compete in this when it's just dominated by this one company that we're never going to be able to touch? Yeah, listeners, uh, timestamp this and come back because I'm going to make some predictions that will probably age very poorly. So uh, <laughs> we, we can go back and I'll caveat with that. But uh, first off with the Chinese, Comac is the company you're thinking of. And uh, they are a significant real competitor that needs to be watched. As you said, they are in the air. The C919, which is the 737 or A320 rival, it is in service in China. And we could spend an hour on some of the corporate corporate espionage and stuff that got it there, but whatever. It's it's there now, and it is a real viable alternative. To me, it is hard to imagine Western demand for this plane anytime soon, right? I, I cannot imagine a world in the near future where Delta United is flying to C-919. And I think that's true of Western Europe right now. Um, and to some extent, the order book is so big for these companies, it could almost ease pressure on them. And, you know, I mean, it'll be kind of a non-factor in the next few years. But uh, that said, it's got to be an issue long term. And it's got to at least be on your radar long term. I mean, Boeing's own forecast is that Asia will account for about 40% of global demand for aircraft through, I think it's 2042, last time they updated this. China is a big part of that Asia total. The rest of Asia, especially around the rim, is is a growing part of it. But look, China is the big market here. So if Comac is only a success in China, it at least dents the long-term growth plans of Boeing and Airbus. And that's giving them no credit for even reaching out to neighboring countries and their sphere of influence, let alone spreading globally. Uh, it's not going to happen overnight. I don't think it's a way a reason to panic sell if you're still in those shares, but if you are going to be interested in Boeing and its whole ecosystem, its supply chain, you have to be aware of Comac, at least for me. Uh, on the other side of it, boom, most of the startups we're talking about, they're not just coming with the same product. Like this, the C-919 is a 737, A320, 
clone competitor, whatever it is. Most of them are focused, the startups are on focused on supersonic or focused on something different. I personally would be surprised if they move the needle anytime soon, especially on the commercial side of it. Um, supersonic, for one, is as much about proving the market for it as it is the tech. The tech is out there. Uh, it's kind of the old argument against Tesla, so it's going to fail. You know, I, I don't know why I'm making it, but I do believe that if supersonic turns out to be a success and something that really is in demand at scale, I think Boeing and Airbus could pivot pretty easily to do a supersonic product. Um, I don't want to dismiss it. As someone who loves to travel, I would love to see it. But I, I think the cost-benefit analysis of supersonic isn't going to work out as well as maybe the PowerPoint slides would suggest. And I don't think the market is going to... I, mean, I, I said Comac, I think, could dent the long-term growth plans. I haven't seen anything more than a niche for these startups. And if anything, it's a general dynamics problem or a Bombardier problem on the smaller business jet side and not a replacement for the seven, the 777 or something like that. Is there anything that you think could either stop the growth or slow the growth of air travel over the next decade? It's, that's a great question. I mean, because look at the last few years, right? We've seen a pandemic, which temporarily, but then, you know, the bounce back was pretty impressive. Um, we have a world at war, and, you know, and, and especially for us, us Western focused, um, you know, right in the heart of Europe that is at war and we're still seeing demand. Uh, I I really believe in long term air travel growth simply because the biggest mega trend out there is the emergence of the global middle class and the emergence of Africa, the BRICS. There's so much more of the world is just emerging and new consuming markets are coming. I'm optimistic in future growth. The question is pace, rate, things like that. And the big thing to me, geopolitics, macro concerns, things like that, that could cost us the pace of growth. But if you look at the way the world is evolving, there's so much opportunity out there. It's such a big world. I do think the number of people that fly and the number of trips will increase over time. Yeah, I think I saw it. Maybe it's surprising because you know, I'm in the United States, but it won't be surprising for our international listeners that I think it was maybe five, 10 years ago, only 3% of the globe had flown on an airplane, something like that. It could could have been six or something like that. But either way, much smaller than, say, the United States, United Kingdom, Japan, places like that. Our last question here, I think this is a fun one. We can take it wherever you want to go. What should investors have on their radars when looking at the aerospace industry, whether it's airlines, whether it's the afterpart market, whether it's the suppliers such as Boeing? What innovations are there? Personally, it seems like nothing has changed from these the standard commercial jets for the last you know fifty years. But curious, what you think should be on the radars here for any investor who's listened to this full conversation? So we get a lot of directions here, and I don't know, uh, but I I like this one, so I'm going to say hydrogen. And to me, this is a real interesting uncertainty. Okay, electric planes are just not going to happen unless we have significant battery innovation. Maybe if some of these solid states happen, maybe then we could talk about it, but it's a simple physics problem. It takes a lot of energy to get a plane to speed and keep it at speed. That requires a lot of batteries. That's a lot of weight, and then you have a downward spiral. Add the weight, you need even more energy. And uh, I mean, short-term, small things, these uh, sort of air taxis, the evodals or whatever you call them, they're coming. They're real. But those are, those are what the Jetsons promised us with flying cars. You are not going to see an electric plane take you over the Atlantic or even across the country in anyone's lifetime unless we really get to work on the battery. Hydrogen, on the other hand, you know, this is a, I mean, by definition, it weighs nothing. So you've solved the weight problem. It is a powerful energy source. Uh, and this is the reason I bring this up, and it's a nice to close the circle on everything that's happened with Boeing and kind of the long term ramification. One of these two companies have invested significantly in hydrogen, and that's Airbus. Airbus believes they can bring commercial aircraft to market by 2035 using hydrogen. 
And these are, they're probably going to be the smaller end of the commercial scale, which is still not going to be the, the, the big triple sevens. Uh, but these are 737 type planes, or at least A220 A2, type planes, big jets. Uh, they have demonstrated the technology. They think they're going to get there. A lot of people are skeptical, but I think we have to watch it. Boeing, on the meantime, is saying it's not going to happen, and we need to devote our resources to making existing technology more efficient. All right? It's the conservative bet, but one might say it's the bet they have to make, given everything we've talked about, their balance sheet, the issues they have, and all of that. I do think, to some extent, Boeing's thinking is driven by the last five, ten years of drama. If Airbus can bring the zero E tech, their hydrogen tech, to market, that's a huge hurdle for Boeing. I said supersonic. I think they could sort of just replicate overnight. Lou, it looks like you cut out there for a second, but you were back now, and you were talking about the potential of hydrogen uh, and how Boeing, if this, if Airbus does succeed in this and bringing it to uh, bringing flights commercially, what could happen with Boeing? There's a world where, like, fast forward to the late 2030s, when we look back on this period in Boeing's history and something that we weren't really even focused on at the time, but just these little things where Boeing did not invest because of its problems, they that is the big story of this crisis, where Boeing didn't invest in the future and Airbus did, and that was ultimately their downfall. Now, who knows if we get there, but that is sort of the one big thing out there that, wow, if this all works out, that's a tough hill for Boeing to climb. Yeah, and if I think we can sum up this conversation, one of the key long-term concerns for Boeing is, unlike a Lockheed Martin, an Airbus, SpaceX, Rocket Lab, some of these other companies, they don't have the flexibility at the moment to be very proactive with their R and D to be ambitious with skunk works type stuff. And that, you know, even if they fix their manufacturing issues could set them behind 10, 15 years from these other companies. Yeah. I mean, Boeing has been in crisis mode for the better part of a half decade now, and it's hard. There's very few examples in history where companies come out stronger from that or come out, you know, better position for the future when, um, you know, first of all, you got to stop the bleeding, guys, but you also have to get back to normal as soon as you can to kind of start building again. And we're talking the latter part of this decade, I think, before that happens. If the last five years occurred when rates weren't close to zero and they Boeing wasn't able to create 2062 bonds at 4% or whatever it was, how much more difficult or how much worse of a place do you think they'd be in? It's a good question. I mean, you know, I, I, I think arguably they took on more cash than they needed. And so maybe they would have had less cushion, but, you know, they, they still would have been all right. But you know, they were probably wise to take on the debt when they did, whether needed or not. And they're fortunate that they got relatively good rates. Um, but, you know, again, it's it's a suboptimal time you know, in the history of this business, just because they're stuck with it now, regardless of the rates. That's a great way to wrap things up. Thank you, Lou, for joining. We had two technical snafus, but I don't think the listeners will even notice. So let me hit the disclosure. We are not financial advisors. Anything we say on this show is not formal advice or recommendation. Ryan, I, or any podcast guest may hold securities discussed in this podcast, may have held them in the past, and may buy, sell, or hold them in the future. Thank you, everyone, for listening to our Wednesday stock research episodes. Hope you got a lot out of this one. We'll see you next time. 